Uh, so this is the second installment of the Berkeley Turing Lecture Series, and we're counting where the research was done, and remarkably, seven Turing Awards were based on work done at Berkeley. Uh, this is kind of part two in that Shafi Goldwasser and Sylvia McCauley shared uh, the Turing Award for the work they did while they were grad students, amazing, amazingly enough. So Sylvia McCauley, besides the Turing Award, was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, won the Godel Prize 25 years ago. And like I said in the email, amazingly, for a theoretician, it has 50 patents and has a startup company right now. Uh, and um, he does many amazing things. But I thought I'd quote what Ave Wiggerson uh, wrote about him, who's a theoretician at uh, Princeton. So it has nothing to do with Berkeley or MIT. This is a neutral evaluation. Macaulay is an intellectual giant of rare variety. His leadership has steered the academic agenda of our field in the key areas. Time and time again, his ideas challenge conventional wisdom with originality, vision, and technique to create what would become tomorrow's better conventional wisdom. And with that, Sylvia McCulloch. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm. so proofs, uh, secrets, and computation. Uh, that uh, this talk is going to have uh, three parts, some uh, thanks, some uh, science, and uh, some uh, advice. And uh, it's only proper to start with thanks. And I'd like to thank you, Berkeley, for my education. I must say it was really a great uh, gift and uh, one really of the milestones uh, in my life. And uh, at the time when I joined, it was in 1980, to the, to the point, you know, I really believe that uh, uh, Berkeley was to computer science, whatever Göttingen was uh, uh, to mathematics uh, at the beginning of the last century. And um, so uh, I must say that you know, I was uh, young and inexperienced, but I really had uh, the sense that uh, I felt uh, at the time that I was at the center of the world. And as I matured and I gained more experience, now I realize I was at the center of the world, okay? <laughs> And uh, with uh, Dick, Manuel, uh, Andy, uh, Dave, and Willem, and, uh, and, and Michael, it was an extremely extraordinary company. But you know, as you know, part of our education as uh, students, uh, we learn from each other as much as we learn from our beloved teachers. So when I say thank you, Berkeley, I also mean uh, a gang of uh, <laughs> a few things. Here is uh, David Lichtenstein from the right, uh, Vijay Vazirani, Michael Sipser. And I, and uh, somehow there are various shots of us, you know, and uh, there is uh, Mike Luby right uh, over there. He didn't make it in, into this picture. And uh, somebody's missing, which is uh, Shafi. So I'll put it up there in uh, Tilden Park, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, quite a while uh, ago. And uh, so really, I think uh, uh, Berkeley is a fantastic institution. I've uh, really is uh, my, my alma mater, and I think it is uh, really an honor to, uh, to mankind. But I also want to say thank you to our field at large, right? You know, uh, uh, thank you to computer science. Because if you, as everybody knows, uh, the last century was supposed to be the century of the atom, and it was, but it was much more the century of the computer. And the advent of the computer uh, in human history has been as momentous as uh, the invention of fire. And uh, somehow it has um, really revolutionized the way we think, even, and the way in which we interact uh, with each other. And, um, and not only for the advances uh, uh, in, in our fields proper, but also of all the interaction we have uh, with uh, biology, economics, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, you, you name it, uh, has been an extraordinary run for computer science. I must say that uh, the great charge at Balaclava was admittedly a very low-tech affair, right? But uh, perhaps uh, uh, it is the best way to signify uh, somehow the impetus of the, of the courage and the intellectual ferocity in which computer science are taking all um, um, world problem. So I I'm extremely proud to belong to this uh, extraordinary scientific community, one of the most strongest co uh, scientific community the world has ever seen, and I hope that you take as much pride and uh, you continue to contribute to it. And this ends my, my thanks. 
And so now we started going at the science, and uh, given that it was you know, our uh, historical perspective and coming back uh, together, I decided that, uh, to discuss uh, some of the science which went, uh, was happening uh, here at Berkeley around, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, Ooh, big numbers, forget it. Um, so some 38 years ago, I'm afraid. So it's, it's a very big number. So and um, so somehow I'd like to start uh, with the uh, proofs so that you know everybody knows and love, right? And uh, they are good for you. So okay. <laughs> and so I don't know what uh, your first proof was, but uh, here was my first proof, right? And uh, you recognize that this is uh, the first um, uh, criterion of congruence of uh, triangles which says that if two triangles have uh, two sides and the angle in between equal, then they are all equal, right? That's uh, great. And, you know, I must say, I found this properly proved, right? And if you're properly proved, you start pulling up axioms, a bit, like between the two points, there is one and only one line. You know, it takes a little, a little bit to prove. And my was my first proof. I was uh, very puzzled. And why was very puzzled? Because the notion that you can say something about reality is not yet observed, right? Because nobody measured this other side, of, right? And nobody measured the other two angles. And the fact that you can actually conclude with a clarity that they are actually the same, I thought uh, it was uh, really puzzling. And after a while, uh, I realized that the proof was right. and. Uh, I concluded that, you know, proofs can be very practical because you don't have to walk there and measuring anything else. You can actually deduce things. And so what are proofs, uh, at least in our tradition? Um, there are many traditions, of course, because mathematics is, uh, is ubiquitous on the planet. It comes from uh, ancient Greece and, um, and it goes back to Gadel uh, and Turing. Here they are. And you know, by the way, these are two guys who were extraordinary guys, right? but very different in characters, you know. And uh, Gadel on the left um, uh, was uh, the epitome of mathematical precision, right? And, uh, and, um, and um, uh, Alan Turing on the right was the epitome of uh, intuitiveness, right? And uh, it was um, really amazing how totally different ways uh, to get uh, at results were. And uh, um, I'm particularly f I'm fond of both, but I love uh, the ability in which uh, Turing uh, could uh, somehow solve a problem by simply defining it better and simplifying, simplifying, simplifying things so much that at the end, the, the, the problem somehow seems trivial uh, or solved itself. But you know, these very two different individuals um, had uh, one thing in common, that uh, they agreed on one thing, that uh, uh, proofs are strings, strings satisfying some special syntactic property. Because and essentially, once you have a bunch of axioms and have inference rules, what is a statement is true? It's something that you can write down in a very precise way. You can write down an axiom anytime you want. Uh, you can invoke, you know, um, um, uh, if, a, if you write down that A implies X, and you write down A, then you are allowed to write down X, and so on and so forth. And if you can write down at the end of this very syntactic, and very syntactically, uh, syntactic way, the statement of a theorem that is, uh, well, the theorem is uh, true by definition. Okay, given these are proofs, so the question is, uh, how about efficiency? Efficiency? What efficiency? Okay, so I'm saying if you don't think that the proof is too long, prove it yourself. Okay, that is the proof. Take it or leave it. Okay, so there is not a question of uh, of efficiency or of truth. Right? Well, you know. At some point in time, Berkeley was a very liberal place, and uh, they challenged many things. We start challenging also these things, and to say, so well, maybe you know, we should uh, never mind. We should try to make the proofs more efficient. And so, if you want to model it, a proof is not the syntactic object, but you start perhaps modeling like there is a prover somewhere. And, um, and we say that it is hard working, and there is some verifier somewhere, and we insist uh, it to be lazy. So um, how much time do we give the proof? Well, there is you no, know, whatever time it takes, infinite time, okay, even. So be very, 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 uh, lots of room. But we insist that uh, the, the, the verifier be lazy, okay? And technically speaking, say polynomial time. Why is that? Because 
unless you make it much easier to verify a proof than actually to find a proof, right? And so all mathematicians will be out of a job because uh, they are not needed anymore because uh, if the time to verify is equal to the time of proving, who, who, who gives a damn, right? So we don't want that. We love our colleagues. So a proof is this syntactic object that may be taken perhaps a long time to find and then you ship it to the verifier and the verifier reads and is convinced of a statement. Okay. Thank you for introducing these two agents, and uh, I like them, they are very colorful, but uh, what are efficient proofs? We haven't solved the question. But the question was actually picked up in the early 70s by nothing less than uh, by Cook, uh, Karp, and Levin, and they put down the notion of MP. What are efficient proofs? Well, vo are those uh, proofs that happen to be short, say, and also easy to verify, short polynomial time long, and easy to verify in polynomial time, okay? By the way, for those who have not seen uh, NP yet, so here is an example. Consider the following theorem X that says that these two, triangle, uh, two graphs are actually isomorphic, okay? What does it mean? Well, here is a colloquial definition. <laughs> they are the same graphs, but they are drawn differently, okay? So far, so, so good. Okay, well, you say, do you need uh, a proof of this that is Pretty clear with these two graphs. Right? Well, how about if there were thousands and thousands of vertices and millions of edges, right? So then uh, it isn't so clear anymore. So then, uh, yes, it needs a proof. Okay. And what does it mean uh, technically that the two graphs are isomorphic? It means that there is an isomorphism. In other words, there is a correspondence from vertices of one graph to vertices on the other graphs that preserves the edges. That means that. Uh, uh, if you say you see vertex one on the left, actually you can identify with vertex five on the right, vertex two you can identify with vertex three, and, uh, and what um, the, uh, the Merlin, the prover, is going to do is that he, he tells the verifier this is the correspondence, once goes to five, two goes to three, and so on and so forth. Okay, this may take, this, to find this correspondence, if it's thousands and thousands of vertices, it may take a while. However, Verifying takes, hey, for any edge that I can, even if there is a million of edges, one by one, if it is an edge from I to J, is there an edge between the corresponding vertices? You do all this, and, uh, and if this checks, okay, the proof is verified, right? So you see that it's an MP, you guess something, which is going to be very hard to find, and then, but you verify it quickly, right? So, Put it a little bit uh, more generally, it's like everybody's familiar for having equations, right? And uh, there are um, equations of all var uh, varieties, and uh, how do you solve an equation? You know, I, my favorite way continues to be plug in some val <laughs> values for the variables and check if, uh, if, uh, uh, if I get zero, okay? So NP is essentially is a way to prove that an equation has a solution. Because the prover finds the solution, which may take a long time, he gives it to you, all you have to do is to plug it in, right? So that's, that's in essence what is MP. But there are, uh, check, this we know, but there are other things. There are other things like co and P. What does that mean? Sometimes an equation has no solution. Okay. If you see there is a solution, all you have to do, which may take a long time, but is at least doable in principle, is to provide somebody some assignments of the variables. But if there is no solution, what the hell you tell him? And uh, it may get worse. So what if you want to prove that uh, the number, the exact number of solution that an equation have? Say, what do you want to prove there are two to the 116 plus 17 solution? Good luck with that. And by the way, there are, there are also other classes, more and more complicated, that are not going to be bothered, right? So therefore, with the notion of MP, given an equation, the only thing you are able to do is to prove that the equation has a solution. Is this good enough? Well, what if you want to prove the rest? So, but we don't know how to prove the rest. Well, we don't know either that or we need the new notion of a proof, okay? That's it. Okay, so let's see if we can come up with a notion of a proof that somehow allows us to uh, uh, to, uh, 
to give answers uh, and, and proofs about all these other type of statements. Let's go back to the basic. We have a proof system. If we want to distill it down, right, how, what do you care about the proof system? Well, I claim that we need the two fundamental properties. First, that all true statements are provable. And second, that false statements are not provable. At the bottom line, that's what we mean. Who cares about the rest? Yes, proofs can be insightful. Proofs can be elegant. But if you go for efficient proofs, what matters is that, well, I want to be able to prove a true theorem, and no, I cannot be fooled by believing a falsehood. The end. So, if you take this, we are already in a good position to start discussing this notion of interactive proofs, right? That was the developer really in the early 80s. And these interactive proofs are no longer our syntactic objects, but they are interactive processes. And as you know, we learn proofs uh, interactively, right? Somebody tries to explain something in the classroom and so on and so forth, right? Uh, never mind what grade it is. But somehow when we formalized, we formalized the left and we didn't formalize the right. But we lived in the right, right? So we got educated over there for a long, long time. So how about formalizing the right? And so, in, if you do this formalization, you are going to have the proofs becomes a game. And let me give you as an example, and the example is a, a joint work of, with uh, Goldreich and uh, Avi Wigderson, who I'm actually happy to say spent many years in, uh, in Berkeley, on and off, and, uh, and uh, so learning and giving whatever he knows. So, here is um, a theorem. We want to prove, say, that these two graphs are not isomorphic, okay? There is no correspondence that preserves the edges for these two graphs. You know what? I can actually prove it on the fly because one, two, three is a triangle on the left and there is no triangle on the right. But there again, if there is a thousand of these spaghetti type of things, it's not clear at all. Okay, so now, our prover wants to convince the verifier that these two graphs are not isomorphic. He has a problem. What is going to say? That is a big problem. Well, you know, because, you know, the number of correspondences, right, between a thousand uh, things is a thousand factorial, right? I have here uh, my good uh, friend uh, Jonathan uh, with us. He's a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and he can confirm what I'm saying, that there are at most two to the 300 uh, elementary particles in the universe. He confirms, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, a thousand factorial oh, is immensely bigger. So you cannot just put as a proof, look at this correspondence, the second possible correspondence, and then you can check that none of them works, really. All right, so what are we going to do? Remember what do we want to do? True theorems are provable, false theorems are not. Let's try to prove it, assume the theorem is true. How do we prove it? Okay, now the verifier locks himself in a cage, Faraday cage, or walls, whatever you, you want, so to have some privacy. And in total privacy in this room, what he does, he flips a coin to randomly choose between the graph G and H. And let's assume he chose G. Then he flips more coin to choose a permutation of the vertices of G. And then, guess what? Applies this permutation to G and obtains a, a third graph, C, that by construction is isomorphic to G. And is going to tell this graph to our prover. And essentially, what he's going to say is the following Dear prover, you tell me that G and H are not isomorphic. You know what I've done? I constructed this C to be, by construction, isomorphic to one of them. Tell me which one. <laughs> Peanuts for our uh, prover, right, who realizes right away with infinite time, oh, say, C is isomorphic to G. So what he has to do is to say, you permuted the vertices of G. And they say, well, that is true, right? So, all right. Because you can see that all theorems are provable because he got convinced, but if he, he played this game again by randomly choosing between G and H again and randomly choosing another permutation P prime and applying P prime, 
the prover, a honest prover has always the ability of telling back whatever graph he chose, right? Because it can only be isomorphic to one. Okay, so then, you know what? In this game, all theorems are provable. Now, let me now argue that false theorems are not provable, okay? All right, so if the theorem were false, I'm gonna let you see. Right now the theorem is false because G is isomorphic to H, H. but the verifier chose a C in the same way, he chose a random one of the graphs and permuted the, uh, the vertices and called C the result. The result is so obtained is actually isomorphic to both. Is more than that, not only is isomorphic to both, but actually is a random graph selected among all the graphs isomorph in the same isomorphism class to which G and H belong. So this guy over there has infinite time, but if he wants to prove that the two graphs are non-isomorphic, how does he do it? He must figure out which of the two of the two graphs, right? Uh, which of the two graphs has the verifier permuted? And I claim that uh, he has only a chance exactly a half to prove it. Okay? Let me prove it the best way. Assume that you and I make the following uh, we play the following game, okay? I being Italian and all, I'm going to do a phone. I'm going to do a phone. I have a coin over here, and I'm going to flip it head or tail, and you don't see what the result is. If comes up heads, I'm going to say, mamma mia. If on the other side it comes up tails, I'm going to say, mamma mia. Mamma mia, what coins do I have? I, now it's pretty clear that you have only a, half, a, a chance a half to figure it out. Because I say mamma mia, whether or not my coins is head or tail. And here, the third graph is a random graph isomorphic to, to both C and H, no matter what the coin was G or H over here. So how, given that I'm going to say the same thing, no matter what the coin toss is, how the hell are you going to figure out my coin tosses? You have exactly chance a half. And by the way, if you repeat this process, and now I want to be believe uh, the prover if he's, uh, I don't catch him making a mistake twice in a row, my probability to catch him the first time was uh, not catch him was a half, the probability of not catch him becomes a fourth, and if I do it a 300 times, it's one and two to the 300, and everybody agrees when two, one over two to the 300 for all humans is practically zero, okay? So then, seems to me that, you know, that is a proof system, is a way to prove that graph non-isomorphism, but you can prove it, it is are not isomorphic, right? And you cannot prove uh, falsehoods. So we don't know if graph isomorphism has a classical syntactic proof that is short and things, but even if it does, it's not going to be as simple as this game. So these games seem to be very powerful. So not only they are efficient, because rather than listing all the n factorial things, there is a very simple interaction that is a proof, in the sense, again, true theorems are provable and false are not. Okay, so if you take this example and you generalize a little bit, you get that whatever these uh, interactive proofs are, maybe you can formalize on this notion of IP, interactive proofs, and then you can actually prove that NP is contained in this class. And by the way, proving that uh, there is no solution is also an equation of no solution in IP. And by the way, proving how many solution or equationals is also in IP. And by the way, P space, whatever it was, in I, is an IP. And I love this result because it absolves me from never define P space. So if you understood <laughs> what IP is, you are done. So what, okay? So thank you very much for this notion of efficient proofs. What, why should I care? Well, let me tell you why you should care and uh, about cloud computing. So right now, I believe that we are going to see it more and more when computation is power and computation is going to be more valuable than oil and a lot of other things. 
And so assume a bit, you know, you want to know what uh, f of x is for some f, right? But unfortunately, you don't have enough computational power to figure out, so you ask to the cloud. The cloud gets the response. Six months later, it tells you, by the way, the answer is 27, and uh, here is my invoice for the computation. Thank you for your trust. Trust what? It says, what? You don't want to pay? I think so then, then, you know, if you don't believe me, evaluate f of x yourself. It says, wait a minute. I'm calling you exactly because I cannot evaluate it with the means at my disposal, okay? So you see that if there is, uh, if you have this alternative efficient way of pulling things, not exactly of the, of the flavor that I gave, <laughs> gave us, but uh, we are going to go over this later on uh, in this uh, presentation, but you can see that now finally there is a way in which you can legitimately subcontract a long computation to others, get the answers, and believe them, not because you trust them, but because you verify them, right? That's a, you know what? Proofs are very practical, again. So let me tell you another thing. But the moment in which now, the notion of a proof is a big deal, because it's one of the foundational notions that we do have in mathematics. And, uh, and now that we start, you know, waking up of a sleeping giant, right? So. Uh, our appetite, uh, forget efficiency, we want to figure out uh, way more things about it. So let me tell you, in fact, about uh, these zero knowledge proofs which were brought up, you know, in the discussion at lunch with some of us. And so let's ask uh, the following uh, more ambitious questions. How much knowledge is needed to verify a proof? Go, well, before we answer these uh, momentous questions, how about, you know, Deciding first of all what is knowledge, or really what is knowledge is that simple. So how about life after death? So, <laughs> so this seems a very uh, very thing. Okay, so zero knowledge proofs essentially is a way to convince of somebody that something is true and nothing else. Okay, and uh, I don't care. Uh, and, and we are trying going to give you both an example and hopefully. A plausible definition, how this can we argue that this is the case, okay? All right, so we are going to have, we are going to define this object very quickly, very intuitively for you today, and we start with the Knowledge Act. The Knowledge Act, you can think of like two basic axioms. Take it or leave it, these are axioms. The first axiom is that efficient computation is free. It's like the air we breathe, no, it's free. What does this mean? Assume that you meet me in, uh, on the street, holding on an integer x on my left and an integer y on my right. And I'm going to say, hey, I have a proposal. You give me a thousand bucks and I tell you what the product of x and y is. You say, this guy must be a madman. Why do you say that? Because you know shift the nad, right? The, multi the faster multiplication. Therefore, multiplying is an efficient computation. So what you're going to say, say, you know what? Thank you very much, but I can multiply exactly, uh, pretty efficiently myself, so I save a thousand bucks and I can compute by myself x times y. This is axiom one, right? You mean you refuse the bargain, the offer. What is axiom two? So random strings are for free also. What does this mean? That means that if you stop in the, in the street and I'm going to say, I have a different uh, something to sell, you give me a thousand bucks and I give you a thousand random bit string. You say, what? I can flip a coin exactly as you do and I flip it a thousand times and I save a thousand bucks. Thank you very much, but no thanks. I don't buy it, okay? Good. If you believe these two axioms, now you are hooked because that's the only thing I need for what follows. Okay. So now we go back to the following theorem. I want to prove that the two graphs, right, are isomorphic. And you remember, we have a way to prove it. You just release the isomorphism. You just tell me this magic correspondence between vertices on the left and vertices on the right that preserves the edges. But somehow, you see, intuitively, this proof has much more knowledge than just the mere statement that G and H are isomorphic. I'll tell you why they are isomorphic. I'll give you the isomorphism, right? You're asking a zero-one question, right? 
are very somatic or not, and tell you not only the why, but here is the specific reason, so look at this, right? So we don't like this, therefore, and so we think it has too much knowledge, even though we didn't define anything. So let me give you an alternative proof, okay? Okay, here is the statement. The prover says G and H are isomorphic. And I'm going to prove it to you. How are we going to prove it? This time the prover uh, starts acting. And what does he do? He selects a random graph isomorphic to both G and H. Right? The coin stands for random selection and he ships it over. You say G and H are the same. And by the way, here is a random graph isomorphic to both of them. Okay, what does the verifier do? He himself now flips a coin and tells me, you tell me that the C is isomorphic to both G and H? Prove to me that C is isomorphic to G. And uh, this time, the prover, because indeed if the theorem is right, there is an isomorphism between the, uh, C and G, Maybe there is one isomorphism, maybe there is two, maybe there is uh, many. Among all the many, he takes a random one, call it phi, is a good name for an isomorphism, and ships phi. Okay? So this is a very classical proof, right? We, that is the type of proof we say, hey, let's reveal too much knowledge. We are going to use it in what we claim is going to be a zero knowledge proof, so we have to be careful. So, right, here is a random graph C, here is a challenge G, here is a proof phi that C and G are isomorphic. And indeed, you verify that phi, once you give it to me, is trivial to verify that it preserves all edges, right? Good. If G and H are isomorphic, the prover can always convince the verifier. Therefore, it is the case that in this interaction, all true statements are provable. Now, let me argue very quickly that false statements are not. I don't have any slides for that. I only need your uh, attention for seven seconds. Assume G is not isomorphic to H. Then, no matter what C, I can ship over to the verifier. Either is not isomorphic to, to G or is not isomorphic to H. And if I'm really dumb, I choose it, but it's not isomorphic to neither one of them. So, no matter what uh, a coin uh, the verifier flips, I cannot produce an isomorphism that does not exist, right? I will be caught in probability at least a half. And if you repeat it two times, right, the chance that I'm successfully cheating is a quarter, becomes one over two to the 300, and forget about it. Okay, you know what? I got convinced. This interaction is an alternative proof. I could have given you an isomorphism mapping the vertices of G to H, but I do this interaction, which is a proof anyway, in the, say, in the way we agree the proofs are. But I claim that this way is not only efficient, but actually provide zero additional knowledge. In other words, at the end of this interaction, you know two things. You got convinced that G is isomorphic to H, but you don't know anything else. Really? Why? It's a good question, because you provide, you give a challenge you get an isomorphism back, it's not so clear. All right. So let me do the following. Assume you didn't have this interaction, right? But assume that the verifier knew beforehand that G were isomorphic to H. Because I claim if the proof proves that G is isomorphic to H and nothing else. So let's assume that we knew that G is isomorphic to H and that's it. Now, I can play this game in my mind as a verifier. Ready? Here is in my mind. First of all, I flip a coin and I choose between G and H and I write down the result, G. Then, I take a random permutation of a vertex of G, call it phi. Then, I apply phi to G and call C the result. And then, what do I do? I write down C above an arrow from right to left. I write G in different order, you see, for above an arrow from left to right. And I write phi above an arrow from right to left. And now let's compare what would have happened if I've interacted with this prover. Okay? I computed on my own three things based only on the knowledge that G was isomorphic to H. And I got a, a proof 
an interaction of the same three things from the prover, but it proves that G is the over 2H, and the only question is, does it reveal more than just that? So what is in the first component? Well, seems to me that the first component is a random graph isomorphic to both G and H in both cases. Right? And it seems to me that the second component is a random one over two, either G or H, chosen at random. And it seems to me that the third component is a random isomorphism among the ones mapping G into H. In other words, whatever I can construct in my head, if I only knew that G is isomorphic to H, is absolutely identical in what I could have gone not knowing that G is isomorphic to H by talking to the prover. I would have learned that G is isomorphic to H, but whatever else this proof has has nothing, because I can reconstruct it if I knew what only the truth was. Clear enough, because coin tossing is for free, and efficient computation is for free, and I can reconstruct whatever is going to happen with the same odds in which I would have happened to construct together with the prover, right? You know, if you want to do the definition, I to be a bit more careful, and the proof is a bit slightly more complicated than that. But that is essentially the idea, right? So if you believe that efficient computation is for free and random is for free, that is a zero knowledge proof. Well, let me tell you where my first motivation for doing these things happened. So a long time ago, I believe I was in high school, right? At the age that you recognize for what I'm about to say, in which I got an acute case of solipsism. Fancy word to say, that you believe that we are, you are the only being in existence in the universe, okay? And the world is a fruit of your imagination. Has ever happened to you? Well, of course, right? So it's, it's, uh, at some point in time, you know, you start uh, thinking of yourself. So, well, so in my case, so I got convinced that everything was a fruit of my imagination. Guess what? Well, if that is the case, why do I have to go to school? So I start not going to school. And uh, second of all, to say, well, why should I get out of bed? I didn't get out of bed. So at this point, my mom right, got very worried. So, so she starts you know, coming to me and says, what is this nonsense of the world that does not exist? No, I do exist. I'm here next to you, and you know, I'm talking to you. She says, ah, you are a fruit of my imagination, or whatever you're saying. I'm letting you say it, right? And you can say that <laughs> there is no way to break this symmetry. So good news, I snap out of it. Um, second good news, I'm here talking about this episode. And uh, the third thing is that this, uh, this thought stuck that you cannot be able to form, if you cannot able to formally distinguish two worlds, you might as well identify it, is really um, uh, what is at the base of, uh, of zero knowledge. Okay, wait a second. How many times in life do you really care that proving in zero knowledge that two graphs are isomorphic? And uh, okay, maybe there are a few theorems like this. Maybe there is a special class of theorems. Well, it is a theorem in the classical way <laughs> that everything provable actually is provable in zero knowledge. Okay, so it's not a question of graphs and theorem. It's a question for is a general statement about theorems, properly stated, the caveats and all the fine prints. So what? So I thought that proofs wanted to convey knowledge. Now you have a theory of proofs that do not convey knowledge, except of a, of a well, what are these good for? Well, let me give you an example, and many others can be brought up. You know passwords, right? Passwords are whatever enable from time immemorial to enter a private property, like a castle. There is a guardian. And he doesn't let you in unless you have the password. The password happens to be open sesame, the knight gets in. As you know, this system, this password system, has some problem. In the moat of the castle, in the water, there may be a bad guy whose only job is to listen what the password is. And he realizes it's open sesame. So next uh, morning, he says, open sesame is get in, right? That's a problem. Now, let me tell you, it gets worse. Because if you are like me, how many passwords can you remember? 
In fact, the fourth, I still have to write down in pieces of paper because otherwise I don't remember. So what I do is that I use the same password in many locations, right? Is that safe? Well, I don't know. It's the only thing I know how to do. So, <laughs> so if the guardian of the castle knows that I'm going to use open sesame in other occasions, he say, gee, Silvio's password is open sesame. He goes to Bank of America <laughs> and says, you know, open sesame, it's, it's, it's just, uh, I want to withdraw a million dollars. Well, poor guy is going to be going empty ended, but you know, you see the, the end. Okay. So what do we do? Essentially, assume that instead you manufacture a theorem that is hard to prove, and I, here is a, something which we believe is hard to prove, but just to give you an example. You know that um, I can select primes. Now we can select even in P. And uh, I select two large primes. I can multiply them. Hey, that is free because it's easy, comp easy computation. Now I know, well, I've done it, that N, the product, is product of two primes. So here, what I'm going to tell um, uh, the castle, this castle, by the way, is a uh, C-cell, the uh, at MIT is the laboratory for uh, computer science and artificial intelligence, so that's the logo. And you say, hey, N is my number, OK? Anytime somebody proves to you that N is product of two primes, let me in, let them uh, do whatever they want with uh, my account. And I can do and say the same thing. And but, but but when I say proof, now I mean that zero knowledge proof, okay? And because it's a zero knowledge proof, C cell will never know neither P1 nor P2. Only knows that n is indeed the product of two primes. But the the end. So you can see that without making, if I use the same thing to Bank of America, you can't. Having learned in zero knowledge that n is the product of two primes, say, okay, n is product of two primes, go and prove to somebody else. You don't have any ability of doing this, right? So you are going to have essentially a password that is perfect secrecy, allows non impersonability, and gives you all kinds of special effects called total deniability that I'm going to spare off with. You know what? You know, proofs are actually very practical. But they're going to become even more practical if we are going to start pressing on the accelerator. And uh, this time, I'm not going to be pressing the accelerator myself because we have here the notion of sampleable proofs, that is an acronym which is a bit easier to explain. That, by the way, uh, means that uh, these are proofs that they are so efficient that you can figure out if a proof is valid or not by r randomly looking at three of its bits. And uh, you see all those bold things? These are the Berkeley people who somehow were uh, at the climax of this uh, great construction. And the last S, or I think the second last S, is the very Madhu Sudan who sits uh, over there, right? So sampleable proofs are really are extremely efficient. Because how more efficient can you get by looking at three bits in a proof, right? Then, then there are also these other uh, CS proofs. and. Uh, and what are these? These are, uh, you know, um, uh, Gerald, whom I quoted above, really believed or proved even that uh, in a sufficiently complex mathematical system, you can be complete, meaning able to prove all, all true theorems, but not uh, consistent. You cannot have completeness and consistent. So consistent means how do you know that in your proof system you cannot prove both A and non-A, right? Unfortunately, he proved in a spectacular a tour de force that you had to choose. Either completeness or uh, consistent, you cannot have both. But CS proofs actually a wonderful proof system because it allows you to prove X and non-X. Really? <laughs> so what is the good of that? Well, there is a caveat that a waiver. You can prove uh, X and non-X, but, but, if it's, but uh, proving a falsehood is arbitrarily hard. And so what does this mean? In that uh, you can actually, by unifying completeness and inconsistency, is like unifying opposites, like Eros and Thanatos, right? And, and you know that if you know in any mythology, all the goddesses, that they are both X and non-X are the powerful one, right? And so what is the power of these things? That somehow 
you can have actually for all theorems, you can actually, the theorems are both prover, efficient for the prover, and efficient for the verifier. Because right now, we didn't discuss how efficient it is for the prover to prove something. Because it's something that becomes a very, very, very hard, it's easy to explain, that say a three years old can get it, but if the time to convince a three year old, it could be that I must spend zillions and zillions of years to find the very slick proof, right? So, so far we had said efficiency on the proof on the side of the verifiers, but somehow by doing things like this, you are actually uh, efficient from both sides. Efficient to prove always, and always efficient to verify. And then there are such a things like rational proofs that are going to bother you with, but essentially is a way to say that truth is a, can be conceived as a maximization of easily computable functions. And finally, we have SNARKs, is a favorite uh, uh, subject of mine. The name uh, proves that uh, we should hire <laughs> uh, PR people to describe what we do, because of this now a succinct non-interactive argument on knowledge. And by the way, let me uh, at least brag about it. That, uh, by highlighting you know, uh, my former students, of whom I'm very proud who really did this. And uh, among you guys, there is a C, this is Alessandro Chiesa, who sits over there, right? Who is really a, the hero because he appears essentially all these things. Okay, now these snacks, what are they? Well, essentially, these are, by taking all kinds of very complex things, the CS proofs, which we just described, non-deterministic components, and zero knowledge, they are proofs that are so efficient that you can actually squeeze it so that you, you can scan your phone with this, these things and figure out if the theorem is right or not. Uh, another way to say it is that you can actually have zero knowledge proofs anytime, anywhere. And if you believe that privacy is good, and if you believe that correctness is good, to have snarks as a snap of a phone is going to be good. So I do believe that these things will prove useful to us as a society in many more ways that we can. I've been just learning that unfortunately I saw I found some time to breathe and learn what snarks are, that Alessandro and company have actually thought about snarks. I didn't have the time to figure out what snarks are, so I believe they're as good as snarks and maybe better, but somehow I think is enough for today. So let me see where we are. We have a notion of classical proofs, right? And that took humanity, I don't know, some thousand years to maybe to figure out, or at least has been standing for a thousand years. And then suddenly, NP, IP, PCP, CS proofs, snarks, uh, rational proofs, it just took a single generation. To me, this is extraordinary, right? Because we have often erected to the sky architecture of great beauty, and, um, but over centuries, right? Here is the Cathedral of Florence, right? No. Everybody puts the foundation, all dead. Then the other one puts another meter of, all dead. Another thing, and finally, here we are. <laughs> so, and you know, investing was an avalanche. I've never seen anything like that, right? So we, we just, you know, totally revolutionized the notion of proofs. Not even a single generation, I'm still here. So it was just, you know, a span of few years, okay? unprecedented. I cannot tell you how excited I am and continue to be about these developments. And uh, proofs, love, and war. Everything is fair in proofs, love, and war. And uh, you know that everything was fair in uh, love and war. And now you also know that everything is fair in a proof because we have been treating these proofs like minced meat and make sausages in any way you want. You want to say we were deterministic, now we are probabilistic. We had to be syntactic, now we are interactive. And whatever it fits us. Why? So because we really care about this object. Everything is fair when you care about the object you are studying. And I believe that when we approach proofs, we approach them all ourselves, and I call science, with our brain, for sure, with our heart and, and emotion, they play a role, our personal history plays a role, and finally our sense of aesthetics. I believe that proofs are quintessentially human. As you know, we people say language was quintessentially human. Baloney, we now know that you know, uh, various animals and things. I don't know if cats care about proofs, maybe I'm wrong, but somehow I think that we are quintessentially human. 
And actually, that is magic bridge between rationality and reality. Because if it's true over here, you know it's true over there, right? That is uh, amazing about proofs. And by the way, I believe that have been uh, our useful ally. When you want to build a bridge, you know, guess what? The people want to have a proof of static. Uh, uh, you know, the static is a very important thing in engineering. But the bridge is going to stand if you actually build it according to the spec. But you know, our world is going to grow more and more complex. And I will not be surprised if our survival as a species is going to depend on proving that something very, way, way more complicated is really is correct. So I want to leave you with this thought that actually proofs are our past, our present, and actually will be more and more our future. I see a lot of proofs out there. OK, so that is uh, enough uh, of science. And uh, now, why not about advice? That's it's free advice. So, so, <laughs> so one advice, uh, particularly to whom, you know, to the students among you, right? And the first advice is that collaboration is key to your success and all of, of our success. Because it's not a zero-sum game, guys. Collaboration wins over competition anytime. And by the way, it is also much more fun. Second thing, be confident and doubt yourselves. Because if you're not confident, you're never going to do anything, OK? So you must. Uh, but if you don't have any doubts that you'll be able to accomplish what you set out to accomplish, you are shooting too low. You really, the, the sweet spot is where you're really not sure if you're going to get it. So be doubt confident and be doubtful. Second fortune. Never be ashamed of luck, OK? My ancestors, I mean the Romans, they defined fortune that without which nothing. Because nothing of importance has been done without a good dosage of luck. And uh, luck has many forms. One is timing, to be at the right place at the right time when some momentous development is taking place. That helps. One is ignorance, because very often, what do you want to do? You want to find a needle in the eye stack, which you know is very hard. But if your eye stack is very small, there are very few stores, you're going to find the needle. So sometimes ignorance is a very good form of luck, because it allows you to find things very quickly. And myopia is also another thing, because if you really know and see very well what you are up against, you'd run the other way rather than charging forward. <laughs> so these are all forms of lucky. So my advice, be lucky. <laughs> Somehow, stubbornness. I'm stubborn as a mule, and I'm proud of it. And I hope you are stubborn too. Because stubbornness is believing in yourself when nobody else does. And um, you know this uh, zero knowledge things that I was telling you about, right? So we wrote uh, with, uh, with Shafi this a while ago, and uh, we thought uh, actually we had a good thing, and we were very surprised that uh, it got canned right away. When the conference uh, results came in, you know, rejected. OK, stubbornly, we rewrote it. By the way, we also changed the title to prevent uh, <laughs> overlapping committee members to reject us right, right away. And now we were hopeful, yeah, reject. Well, we persevered. So here is another thing. That is the original writing still there. And now, you see, we change the strategy. We say, perhaps we take too long to take. I'm going to say, the goal of this paper is to show to measure the amount of information contained in a proof. Let's start with the following example. Example. <laughs> That's, that's good. OK. OK, so finally, we acquired a, a co-author. And, uh, and he says, you know, guys, you know, <laughs> so, uh, let me know how to write it. And uh, he says, uh, he wrote the introduction, Charlie. And uh, I also did other things also in the, in the paper and in the proof. But communication is a tool for transferring or exchanging knowledge. In traditional computational complexity or communication complexity, the goal is to communicate as much knowledge as possible, as efficiently as possible. 
Since all participants are considered good friends, no one cares if more knowledge than necessary is communicated. The situation with respect to cryptographic protocols is very different. <sighs> what a beautiful <laughs> prose. <laughs> Be I don't know. Okay, a year later, finally, we got the happy news that the title changed completely now, is the paper was in. So, advice, be stubborn, believe in yourselves. The other thing is to say, well, I believe in myself, but I can, I'm, uh, I have some limitations, right? The truth is that our limitations are our strengths. Because by being limited, we are forced to approach a problem in ways in which unlimited people, both lucky ones, they don't even think. So limitations actually can be on your side. In fact, it, the case can be made that sometimes it's a good technique to artificially limit yourself to enhance your chance of victory. And the best example is really Hernan, Hernan Cortez in 1519, right? He uh, disembarked with uh, a few hundred people and to conquer Mexico. Really? Mexico was guarded by, it was an empire, right? Um, 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 the Aztec Empire of a few hundred men, what do you do? He had this brilliant idea to sink the ship, thereby limiting himself by not being able to possibility of coming back, and by limiting himself, making himself invincible and conquering an empire. So somehow, enjoy your limitation. And he says, okay, so I, uh, I'd like to do, but say, wh wh what should I do for my PhD? Where wh wh is the usual things, right? So, so where do I find the inspiration? You know, Tolstoy tells us that if you want to be universal, speak of your own village. I'm telling you that you don't even need to go out of the house, because if you actually speak of the, I don't know, some particle of the left uh, upper ventricle of, uh, of your own heart, you are going to be universal. Because the truth is that the source of uh, every creative work, whether artistic or scientific, is the, an emotional problem that we carry within us since childhood. And we want to solve that problem. And we'll never tire because we want to solve the problem that bothers us, right? So my problem was really interaction. Meaning, as I explained before, is there really somebody with whom to interact? And if there is, should I fear the interaction? So that was my problem. That's what um, I, I, I tried to solve. So we had to figure out what are your problems that bothers you and go after it. And, um, and so I must say that the self-discovery is a very tortuous path, but you're going to find guardian angels as I did. And, um, and therefore, you are going to f you're going to find your own guardian angel, and uh, you have to go and solve your own problem. So find yourself is my advice. And uh, I know it is difficult because the path ahead is very long and our legs is so short. However, do you have anything better in life to do than figure out what, what you want and, uh, from the world and what you really are? I don't think so. So accept your fate, pack your bags, and start going, you know, step by step <laughs> with confidence, joy, and actually with good luck. Thank you. Hey, maybe we are done. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. So, assume that we have found a way, as you have done, um, to efficiently, with zero um, resources, prove anything that we would like to prove, like truth versus falsehood. How do you? What's your thoughts about like what exactly do you want to prove in the first place? What the statements are worth 
being applied, this, this machinery to be applied to? I think that is also a fundamental question, is that how do you want to prove things? Like, what are those statements? There are many statements that you may want to prove or not. Well, you know, um, first of all, I really stand what, what I say is that, you know, uh, computation is the new oil. This is the new fundamental resource. And um, so I think that, you know, we want to be able to trade computation. And my, my favorite answer is prove to me I'm going to hire you to compute on my behalf. And I want to see that whatever you come back to is true. Otherwise, how the hell you prevent trade? And um, trade is important. I believe that it is uh, at the basis of civilization. And I believe that if you believe, as I do, that computation uh, is doing, correctness of computation is really a great, a great start. But by the way, you know, once we have uh, a tool, we have to figure out uh, where to use it. And, uh, and so and this is going to be required to be as creative as uh, in forging the new tool is to figure out where to apply it. Um, uh, you talked about using a zero knowledge proofs to verify passwords, but I think there's still uh, like passwords being uh, stolen from companies. And so, are these companies uh, not using zero knowledge proofs to verify passwords yet? And if so, why? how dare they? The answer is yes. Can you believe it? Okay. So then, here is a little bit of a, a, a frustration that you know, any academic uh, shares that somehow you realize what is possible and you realize what people are actually using in practice, okay? And uh, there is a very big gap. And it's extremely frustrating, uh, as, a, as, a, um, uh, as, as we know, but we have to accept as, as a reality. But I think if we are stubborn and we keep on adding and adding and adding, I think we are going to figure out that we are going to make a, a, going to make a breach. And then there are those magic moments in history in which the gap with this theory in practice is actually reduced. And so it, it really goes very fast. So it may be that in some of these things, we're going to have an accelerated effect in which there is a resistance to adoption. Because, by the way, it's some complicated stuff. And so, but once you actually do it, once actually after we educate um, our own students, whatever used to be complex becomes actually trivial. And then uh, things uh, be, uh, will start to be applied uh, in the world. I think that uh, um, we are no difference in computer science, uh, in theory or in systems or anything else, as we are in physics. Uh, you can tell me, right, Jonathan uh, is a physicist. I can tell you, it, it, it takes very often decades before we can approach to use whatever we know. So that is actually a challenge always, but it should not be, it should not stop us. Because uh, that's why I believe that you know, funding and uh, conducting basic research against not immediate applications is actually a good thing. Hey, good Thank job. You Thank you.